She brought the because I drink black cherry. Thank you so much for coming out today to Jalopy Theater on this lovely Saturday afternoon. I really appreciate you hanging out with me. Uh, my name is Ethan Linewand. I'm a piano player, currently from in St. Louis. I'm uh, from Connecticut originally. I lived in, in New York for about six years before moving down to St. Louis about five years ago. And I'm going to give you guys a, sort of a history history lesson and uh, you know and its and its performance practice of uh, Barrel House Blues Piano, kind of obscure, but really sweet genre of music. So I'm gonna talk about you know, where it came from, I'm gonna talk about what it sounded like and how it sounded different in different regions and kind of different regional ideas. I'm gonna talk a little bit about its legacy, and what it left behind in American music, and uh, for li probably why it's forgotten, because I think that's an interesting point, because this music has been forgotten uh, even though it was a really important part of American history. Uh, so, so to talk about the history of, of Barrel House Piano, to talk about the history of American music, you have to start with Ragtime. Ragtime was the great first uh, of American music. And um, so I, I want to play some rags for you first to give you a sense of where this music started from. Uh, Ragtime employs a, a stride bass. A stride bass is the one where, because I'm going to talk about stride, I'm going to be talking about terms like boogie woogie, and I want to give you a little sense of what that means. So in stride, we're talking about um, where you play a bass chord. That'll take on a lot of different iterations in, uh, in ragtime one way, and then it'll develop in different ways, but that's the main idea of a stride piano. And the main idea of a boogie woogie piano, which we'll talk a lot about, is things that uh, have sort of repeated... Uh, rhythmic riffs like so we're talking about the left hand rhythms so that's just a little bare basics of some terms we're going to be using but I'm going to start off with the rag when rags came out they employed that stride that strided bass they were they, they came out of marching really marching music was a big influence on that but it employed a lot of syncopation the first great rag was uh, that was super popular it was 1899 and was Scott Joplin's the Maple Leaf Rag and so I'm going to play the Maple Leaf Rag, and you can hear it's like a, a multi-strain piece. That's the way the, these rags work. There were three to four parts. This one has uh, four parts. It plays the A part twice, the B part twice, goes back to the A part, changes key for the C and the D part. So I'm going to, I'm going to play that tune. It's the Maple Leaf Rag. <laughs>
piece was disseminated through sheet music. That's how people found out about it, and uh, that's how a lot of people learned it. It's not to say it wasn't played on all kinds of string instruments and by string bands of all various uh, sizes and shapes, but it was, a, it was a, a piano music. It really started off the ragtime craze. I mean, it was, a, it was a very important piece, and people got super into ragtime. He wasn't the only guy writing rags at the time. Uh, the first African-American to publish a rag was Tom Turpin, and Tom Turpin was based in St. Louis, my hometown, so... I want to play a piece from 1903 called the St. Louis Rag. Just another example of this uh, beautiful ragtime music, a multi-strain piece, uh, two beat. You see me stomping on the one, two, two, one, and two. It's going to be different from sort of the later stuff that's going to be more of a, of, of a pulsed out four beat kind of music with more swing. So right now, you're not really hearing swing. Apparently, Scott Joplin did talk about swing in music, but it wasn't the idea of like the, the swing in eighth note. It was more like this big pendulum swing of dynamics and how you create these great feels. And that was, what, was something that was really important to him. But this is, uh, so I'm gonna do one more rag. This is the Tom Turpin's The St. Louis Rag from 1903.
comes sort of like, you know, the real popular music uh, and in the, in the, te in the, all through the aughts and the early part of the teens, ragtime is, is uh, going to keep developing. It's going to infuse its way into popular music, so in, in popular songs that are still being disseminated in sheet music at this point. But some of those ragtime and syncopation ideas are going to be a big part of that music. Um, and now let's start to get into some of the, the Barrel House stuff. So, um, so I guess the first thing I want to do is play some examples of, of just some folk blues melodies that, were, that you would have heard on piano that guys, that young kids recall hearing, uh, you know, in, the, in the, the middle part of the, the teens, 1912, young kids were starting to hear this sort of, these sort of folk melodies. And one guy in particular, Little Brother Montgomery, my very favorite piano player, one of them anyway, uh, he, he, had a, he was born in 1906, and he, these are some of the tunes that he remembers hearing as a little kid. So a good example of that sort of deep south uh, blues. So we think about um, the blues really being like, a, you know, a, song, a, a style of song that emerged in the African-American community in the deep south, and, and probably in, in Missouri and places like that as well, you know, sometime in the 1900s, but we don't know too much more about that stuff. It's a lot of conjecture. So I'm going to try to tell this story through the piano to give you sort of a different perspective on, 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 on ways to think about the blues. So the first thing I want to play for you is a piece, uh, this is called the Tremblin' Blues. And uh, little brother Montgomery learned this from a fellow named Cooney Vaughn. And Cooney Vaughn was reported to be the best piano player in Mississippi in the teens. And he would play all the different barrel houses and stuff like that. And he wouldn't just play blues, he could play you know, all styles. He was, he was super ragged. There's a few recordings of him later with a band called the Mississippi Juke Band and he's cutting loose in the mid-30s and some awesome stuff. But, uh, but this piece he never recorded, but it's remembered by Little Brother Montgomery, and it's just to me a great example of the sort of melodic folk blues that would have been happening in the early part of the 1900s, maybe late 1900s, late aughts, early, early teens. This is the Tremblin' Blues. <laughs>
that's the, that's the trembling blues. And you see it's not a multi-string piece, it's just the 12-bar blues form uh, repeating and repeating itself in different ways and different melodies. Um, I'm going to do one more of a sort of a folk blues. Just a, this, is a, this is what Little Brother des described as old Louisiana-style blues that he would have heard as a little kid. And I'll show, again, we're still using that sort of strided bass style that was really prominent in ragtime and, and in popular music in those days. taste of that sort of folk blues tradition that would have been emerging around this time. Now, um, so you have this happening, right? You have this, you have popular music is going on, doing its thing, there's a lot of ragtime in it, and it's all disseminated through sheet music, and you have this uh, sort of music uh, happening sort of underground, you know, where, where in African American communities this music is starting to emerge. And when people find out about it, people find out about it, the first blues start to get published in 1912, and one of the first ones is the Memphis Blues, that's W.C. Handy. And what W.C. Handy has done is he's heard these, these old melodies, and he's inserted them in basically ragtime. He's inserted a blues form into, into a, one of the strains of a ragtime piece. So when we think about the first blues, you really can't, that's why I played ragtime first, because you really can't think about this music without ragtime, because it was through ragtime that this music was first disseminated and first had form, took shape. So I'm going to play for you the Memphis Blues, W.C. Handy's Memphis Blues, and it's going to sound a lot like the earlier rags. But that third strain, there's an A strain, a B strain, and a C strain. And uh, that third strain, though, is, is a 12-bar blues. And so this is the Memphis Blues, 1912.
So, so there you go to say that's like one of the first blues that pretty much sounds like a rag, you know, and uh, I think that's, an, an, like I said, an, an important aspect about this music. So his big hit comes in 1914 when he comes out with St. Louis Blues, and St. Louis Blues is uh, basically in, in, a, in a, a song form, and then there's a verse and there's a chorus, and the, the, the verse is that iconic um, uh, tango. <laughs> Sounds a lot like a rag. It's more like. Over time, that's going to start to sound more like. You take on some of those really sweet swinging, swinging qualities. But what's happened then with this song is what happened is blues has boom entered the, the popular music scene. It exploded. And then what you have for the next half a decade, from 1915 to 1920, is blues, and into the early 20s, is blues at its most popular than it will ever be in any other time. And we, we don't really tell that story. For us, blues, if, if, it's a, if we're talking about blues history, you know, we, uh, it's, you know, so music history in general, it's about where you are today, right? That's what makes... That's what makes music history so interesting. You really want to tell the story of, like, why are we where we at today? And where we're at today is, like, Eric Clapton. Like, if we think about the blues, the, the blues story that got, got sort of co-opted or used up is how you get to Eric Clapton and those guitar heroes. And that's a story through Muddy Waters and that kind of electric blues into the Delta, the Robert Johnson story, and, and sort of his, his, the guys who he learned from, Sun House and, and Charlie Patton and those folks. Um, and that's... One, one way to tell the story, but it leaves out when really blues was at its most popular. And in this time, blues enters the popular music and it's everywhere. It's infused itself into all the old ragtime, into the popular songs. And if you are, and so you had this great, you know, folk blues tradition, but really people learn about it through the popular blues tradition. So they've all melded together. And when you come back down south and you picture a 16 year old, a 16-year-old African-American kid in 1919 in Louisiana or Mississippi, this is their youth music. Like, this is the thing they're growing up with, this is the thing they're most proud of, this is the thing they want to play that their parents don't necessarily understand, but it's their music. And I think we too often make the mistake in blues of only imagining uh, the old black uh, fella on the porch just, you know, playing that music, because that's sort of how the folk revival uh, showed it to be. But really, it's a youth music. I think that's an important part, and that's, to me, how you come to understand... Uh, Barrel House Blues and what's about to happen. So what you have is all these great young kids in 1919, 1920, these 16 year old kids hanging out with each other in different areas around the country and they're saying like, well like this is what I can do with the blues. So they all start to, to give their own touches to it and this is really where Barrel House Blues emerges. To me it's that combination of, of basically popular blues re-emerging as a, as a new folk tradition. And that's what this great, great music is all about to me. So now I want to get into some of that Barrel House Blues. We sort of set it up. And uh, the first thing I want to play is a tune that, that comes from the, the Vicksburg area in the, in the early 20s. It's a song called the 44 Blues or the Vicksburg Blues. It has this great history. You basically have all these young kids starting to play with this idea, this, this sort of idea of these great little rolls instead of, you know, what was before, just a strict stride or things, you know, you have these, and kind of hitting, hitting the piano fast, sort of doing some train imitation stuff, but the idea is, so it's called the 44, so the 44s was a train that ran from, in, 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 the, in, in Mississippi, from, from Vicksburg to Belzoni, which is nothing, this is a hyper-local train, you know, and why, why would they choose that tune? Because it was a hyper-local tune, and that's how they wanted to separate it. This is our insider tune, you know, just like if you listen to like a hip-hop song today, they might be rapping about, you know, a, a, a train or bus they take that might not mean anything to you, but to them, it's their community, that's what they're speaking to, and this is the same thing that's happening then. So it was their way of being like, oh man, you don't know the 44 as well, you're not really hip to this thing. And so this was a, how this tune developed amongst a group of piano players. And so we learn about it in 1929. It first gets recorded by Roosevelt Sykes, the great, great St. Louis 
well, he was down south and in St. Louis, uh, Arkansas and St. Louis, a uh, piano player, and he put great words to it. I wore my 44 so long, sure made my shoulder sore. But before that, it was really, it was about the train, you know, it was more, it was more the 44 train, um, which just ran from like 1917 to 1921, that was it, and it was gone. Uh, but I'm going to do a version, so li it was, there, was, there was all this drama attached to that tune because little brother thought that he wrote it, him and a bunch of piano players and most guys that, that never got to record, Ernest Johnson and Long Tall Friday and all these guys, they're just names now, but uh, to me I, I totally nerd out about it when he's just listing off the names, you know, and there was, you know, like Big Brother Johnson and whatever, whatever all these guys. But uh, so uh, he, he says that there was this fella named Porkchop. And Porkchop, his, name, his, his, real, his real name was Lee Green, so he actually did record. So Lee Green, who was a, a tailor, a clothes presser, and back then, you know, if you were a clothes presser, like, you, mm, that's a, you, you need a lot of muscle, that's not, a, that's not dainty work. And he was a clothes presser, and he really wanted to learn the 44s, this, according to Little Brother. And little Brother was kind of always bitter about this, because Lee Green went on and taught Roosevelt Sykes this tune, and then Sykes was the first person to record it, so he sort of beat Little Brother to it, in 1929, and then Roosevelt and Lee Green and even uh, this fellow from, from Chicago, all these people recorded it before Little Brother got his chance to show you know, a tune that he thought that rightfully was, was sort of his piece. So it was always a point of contention you know, moving forward. And really what happened was Roosevelt Sykes had a hit with it. I mean, it wasn't just like, it was an important piece. And this piece later on is covered by Howlin' Wolf, Eric Clapton, our boy, all that stuff. So like, uh, it was really important. And then, and what happens after 2019, 2029 is the depression, right? The depression hits. And if you were a, 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 a blues recording artist at that time, only the most popular were being recorded. So Roosevelt kind of got to record through that era. Most other piano players, like Little Brother Montgomery, wouldn't be able to record again until 1935. So he kind of lost out in multiple ways and was always a little bitter about it. Uh, so, so here's my version. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of meld a little bit of the Lee Green style, a little bit of Little Brother style to give you the, the Vicksburg or the 44 blues. <laughs> Thank you. 
brother would say is you just gotta roll your hand and open it. So he would teach little kids how to do that. And he shows some examples of him, like the stuff he used to learn, how he, his progression of learning, and one of the very first things that he shows is like taking the blues and then. Like really learning that way. And because, yeah, that was, that was, the, that was the thing. So uh, another uh, important element of, of the Sparrow House Blues was instead of the multi-strain piece, you just kind of put a whole lot of things together. All, and you keep changing the rhythm up and you keep changing sort of the left-hand pattern. And one of the earliest guys to, to demonstrate that on record was, uh, was another guy from Shreveport, Louisiana. His name was Will Ezel. And he was a cool pianist. He was a, really a, a, a playing the sawmills down there and moved up to Chicago. And he was uh, one of the house pianists for Paramount for a few years making records with Elzadi Robinson and a few others and teaching some guys up here, up, up north, some, some of these moves. So I'm going to do just sort of an example of his. It's called Barrel House Woman. It's got elements of that 44s, just a few other things, so just a little bit more of that, that Barrel House idea. bringing in Boogie Woogie, Boogie Woogie into the picture. So Boogie Woogie is, you started to hear a little bit about, in that zone, started doing this. That's the walking bass, and it's a big part of where, where Boogie Woogie gets started, going from that stride, which is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, one, and two, and three. So they call it like eight to the bar, and they call it different things like that. They had all different names. Some people call it the Dudlow Joes, or, or Fast Texas, all these different things. Um, it, 
It got its name from, from an Alabama piano player. There was some cool sort of boogie-woogie stuff happening again in the same way that that kind of that move was happening in the Deep South in places like Alabama, they were starting to mess with this, these sort of rocking bo uh, boogie-woogie sounds. And two piano players who were from Alabama but eventually moved to Chicago and settled there really were the most important guys to really spread in what would become boogie-woogie. One guy's name was Cow Cow Davenport. And Cow Cow Davenport was called Cow Cow Davenport because he wrote the Cow Cow Blues. And uh, it, this, this strain is a pretty common strain that sh showed up in earlier ragtime, but he really popularized it here. It would be later used as Ray Charles' Mess Around. So there's another tune that has a long, long tradition that starts in this, this, uh, this time period. But this is, so this is 1929, and Boogie Woogie starts to emerge really as a, as a style. And we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about more about what happens, because Boogie Woogie will eventually going to become this really popular music in the early 40s. But again, this is a decade after it was really uh, super relevant in the African-American community. It, it had this revival. It went to this concert, and people got all into it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But first, just so there's the emergence of using these barrel house ideas and starting to walk it more and add more of those rhythms. This is the Cow Cow Blues, a great train imitation and a classic melody. <laughs> Mississippi Sheiks recorded as the Jackson Stomp, which is a great rollick version of it, uh, Eleven Bar Blues version, and uh, so uh, it was a great tune. Had a long tradition, and even in its time, it was popular. It's a tune that that people caught on on. They you know they wanted to get their hands on this. This music 
there are all these regional styles, but but an important thing to remember about this time, and this really goes back to the 19 teens, everything was connected by train, and popular music had a way of getting everywhere. So these aren't things that are happening strictly in isolation. You could be a, a rural uh, Mississippi piano player and at night be up in Chicago, you know, and be hearing and be hearing some stuff, hanging out with. With, with those guys and picking up a thing or two, hang out with Jimmy Blythe or Clarence Williams, who knows, and then be back down, uh, uh, you know, the next day and, and show what you learned or maybe they now learn something from you. So it's a cool thing about this time. The other guy who uh, was real important in the Boogie Woogie was, um, was Pine Top Smith. And uh, he, his tune was called Pine Top Boogie Woogie, and that's where the term Boogie Woogie really comes from. Before that, it had many different names. It was just an element of Barrel House Blues. It wasn't this specific thing. It was just part of this great way of playing raucous piano music. You have to, you have to remember also in this time, this is Prohibition time. So you, it's not like you can have these big open air parties. A lot of times things are happening in rent parties, in underground places where all you need is a piano player. So this piano player would start getting these styles, getting everyone dancing, just one man and a piano. So it's a great time. In, Ch in New York at this time, this is when Harlem Stride is popping off, when James P. Johnson and Fats Waller are all, and, and Willie Lyon Smith are chopping each other's heads off without techniquing each other. So I think one of the main differences between uh, this music and the Harlem Stride is it wasn't as much about out techniquing each other. It was about getting people dancing. So what? So it became a little. It's a little bit more about the groove. Um, now, those guys could groove, you know, I'm not taking away anything from that sound, but I think that's how, how it really differs. It's not so much about technique, it's about feel. Um, so, Pine Toss Boogie Woogie, I'm just going to do an, sort of a rough example. It's not a tune I play too, too much, but it's, but it's sort of, uh, uh, but it's a cool piece in it. He's talking a lot, he's like, this is Pine Toss Boogie Woogie, and tell that girl in the red dress to come stand by me, you know, which is what you have to do as a piano player, I guess. So, this is uh, Pine Toss Boogie Woogie. <laughs> repeating left hand pattern in this case it's, th it's sort of this one and this sort of becomes the ubiquitous thing of, of boogie woogie uh, because those that stuff that sound really catches on in Chicago in Chicago they really get into that um, that that one one repeating uh, 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 left hand phrase ostinato pattern and and we'll do it over all sorts of uh, tunes in different ways um, in 1929 some really cool stuff was going on so what happens is um, 
in, in, in the late 30s, there's a concert from Spirituals to Swing that happens in Carnegie Hall. And, uh, and John Hammond brings in these three boogie-woogie players. He would have brought in Robert Johnson, but he just died. And he, so he was going to do this big show. And, and for the big grand finale, they brought out three pianos and these three boogie-woogie players, uh, Albert Ammons, Mead Lux Lewis, and Pete Johnson. And they played the, this ferocious boogie-woogie sound. It was, it was a lot fuller than that. And at this point, swing music had really taken off. So actually what they're playing by this point is more of a swinged, swing version iteration of Boogie Woogie, but that's what becomes super popular and really uh, catches the nation by, by storm. It becomes uh, the great popular music for a little while and it survives in rock and roll. That's sort of like, you know, Jerry, Jerry, uh, Boogie Woogie with a band is, is, is rock and roll. You sort of go from like swinging, you straighten out a little, you straighten it out a little more. that backbeat a little more and you kind of get right to rock and roll. So that's something I think is really cool about Barrel House Blues is that Barrel House Blues is really the music that connects ragtime to rock and roll. It's through the whole thing that you can get there in this really, in this really cool way. But it's, it's sort of a story that's not told and Boogie Woogie, Boogie Woogie has come to be forgotten as this sort of novelty piano piece style. It's, it's played a lot in Europe. They, there's, a, there's a pretty big or sizable uh, Boogie Woogie community about here. There's not a lot of it and, and part of the problem is that they don't, con that, that Boogie Woogie is sort of this footnote in music history. It's sort of this free-floating footnote, and it's not really attached to anything, and because you don't talk about, because it's not attached to the Barrel House Blues history. So this all stuff is all forgotten. All of it as an uh, African-American folk art form is just sort of gone completely. So you just have this free-floating Boogie Woogie idea, and you have like, well, this, this couple guys from Alabama came to Chicago, and, and then it, it exploded as this style, but, it, but they don't connect everything, so it kind of gets lost. And then, and it doesn't get connected to ragtime, and all just why it's important just gets lost because so often our stories of our we have a blues story and a jazz story of history, you know, they're just they just seem to go this way. And you have if you have if you're talking about jazz and you're talking about piano, well, you can talk about you know ragtime to the Harlem stride to to uh, bebop and all that, and you sort of this create this straight line and you leave out all this blues piano. Or if you're talking about blues, generally you're talking about guitar, so there's no reason to talk about boogie woogie or any of this great stuff. But there was so much great piano blues happening all throughout this time. In St. Louis, there was a piano tradition that didn't quite boogie, it didn't quite stride. It was the lowdown sound. It was this really cool style of, of, of piano, and it would become what most recorded blues was like in the, that was doing that urban style blues was really, was this sort of style. So I'm going to play just a, a, a little bit of just sort of the lowdown St. Louis style, just to give you a sense of it.
kind of have to stop myself because I could do a whole I could do a whole 90 minutes just on the St. Louis style, what that sort of piano, what the, the piano blues that emerged there, and how that influenced all later blues and found its way in. But I think I need to pivot back and just focus a little more on, on the Barrel House stuff and not, not go too tangential. But that was an important part of another music that's greatly lost today is the music of Leroy Carr and Scrapper Blackwell. That's a piano guitar duo. It's music of Tampa Red and Georgia Tom, another hokum piano guitar duo. This is the kind of music in the late 20s and through the mid 30s that was a huge part of blues, really some of the, some, some of the most prolific artists were these guys, or piano players like Petey Wheatstraw and Walter Davis. These guys have sort of been forgotten by blues history because we've lost that piano and the idea of what the piano gave. But that really is such cool stuff. But okay, but we're gonna pivot. So then, okay, we're gonna pivot. We're gonna go. We're gonna move. We're gonna go to like 1935, 1934, 35. So what happens is, you can record again. Like the people are people. People are open for business. There, are, there, are, there are there are teams of recording units going down south and traveling, so to places like like New Orleans. New Orleans will do a, a recording session uh, with a lot of great players will come in and play, and one is Little Brother Montgomery, and he'll he'll record. Uh, I think it's 15 tracks in one day. He, he was ready, you know what I mean? He had all these tunes, he was ready to go. And this is sort of like the quintessential uh, barrel house blues. You're in the mid-30s, sort of ideas of Boogie Woogie have spread all around, so that's getting into his music. All the old stride styles, all the, 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 all the different ways and techniques, and nobody really plays it or sums it up as, as good to me as this tune called The Ferris Street Jive by Little Brother Montgomery. Ferris Street is a street in Jackson, Mississippi. But here you're going to hear some of those boogie elements and, and stride elements and all that and all that and the ragtime elements and fun stuff like that.
at the Ferris Street Jive. Little Brother Montgomery doing it up. Also in the, the late thir in the mid 30s, the mobile units start going down to Texas. So you start to hear the, the Texas blues tradition. And Texas Barrel House blues tradition is super cool. There's a lot of sort of ragtime influences in it. And uh, all these great styles, we call it the Santa Fe School, because they used to travel the Santa Fe train to get to, get to those gigs it's in the Houston and sort of Galveston area. And so a whole school of real virtuosic piano players start to emerge. I'm going to do uh, two tunes from that, from that area. I'm going to do a tune called the Ma Grinder. And Ma Grinder is cool because the guy who played it, Robert Shaw, he only recorded later. And he, this is how he played this music, is how he played it in the 30s, and how he was going to play it the rest of his life lived, lived into the 80s. And on one chorus, he would karate chop the piano, sort of this way. And that's because one of the guys he learned from was, was, limp, was lame in his left hand. He had fallen off the train and couldn't use his left hand, so that, that's how they did it. There were all kinds of colorful characters down there, like uh, Peg Leg Will and uh, Nine Finger Charlie. Yeah, that, that's what I wanted. That's what I wanted to hear. Apparently, Nine Finger Charlie could really play. But so I'm going to mess around with that as much as I can. That sort of karate chopping idea uh, of this tune. And this is like, again, this is like Barrel House Blues with a lot of different things uh, going on, changing styles a lot, and um, and guys trying to be different from each other. So developing this this shared repertoire of its own, like I can do it this way. So there's a, so there's a tune called The Cows down there. And like five or six different piano players, you can hear them all kind of doing it different. And it's a, re a really cool thing about the Texas tradition. So this is the Ma Grinder. <laughs>
Yeah. A little bit of the cow. You see, it's like kind of ragged. It's, it's, it's so that Texas tradition, then you see like that, that ragtime stuff was really still a big part of all this music. We were, we were, we were been playing all this stuff that's a little more on the uh, boogie woogie side, but that, but that ragged, that ragged touch is still a really big part of all this music and it's happening a big time in Texas. Um, and um, I'm going to do one more Texas tune for you guys. It's called the West Dallas Drag. It's one I'm working on for a while, so I'm glad I can finally start to start to mess with it because it's like got all that stride stuff that's that's a little tough. So this was this was the B side of, of probably the biggest hit of that of that uh, that came out of that tradition. A song called "Black Gal" by Joe Pullum. Joe Pullum sung in this high falsetto voice, and uh, this was a big hit for him. And it's a great tune, so I do recommend checking out. Joe Pullum's Black Gal, if you, if, you, if you want to. And on the B-side was this solo piano record, uh, the West Dallas Drag. And, uh, and uh, you can really hear, it's like got that earthy sort of Texas, Texas sound, kind of like that tune, but, uh, but it's also implementing some, uh, some more like stride piano kind of stuff. So here's West Dallas Drag. I guess I got about 15 more minutes left, and uh, if there are questions, you know, you, you can just shoot them off, you know, now. But if there's none, I'm just going to keep on moving a little bit. Why Barrel House? Why is it called Where, Barrel House? Where does that come from? Well, that's like, that, well, so a Barrel House was um, kind of like, well, it had a couple different meanings. So you could say, like, you know, my Barrel House and girl, it could be like an adjective. You know, it's kind of to get low down, you know, like she, my, my woman Barrel Houses, because the Barrel Houses were basically like the barn, the converted barn. And, and so in, in, in Texas, for instance, uh, the barrel house was you'd be working in a, in, a, in a secluded work camp basically, and then and then when time off the weekends or the nights they take the company barn they turn it into like a makeshift bar they serve you know whiskey right out the barrel or, or chalk houses you know so you just drink that 
that, I don't know, that's the prohibition kind of stuff. It's like not the kind of stuff you want to be drinking. So, so that's the thing. So that's what, the, that's, that's what some of that term kind of comes from, the idea of the, the barrel house. But this music was happening, you know, in barrel houses, in juke joints, in road houses, in rent parties, and things of all that kind of nature. And even some of the clubs. Some guys didn't like to play the barrel houses. It was too rough for them. Some guys only like to play the barrel houses, and they said by like, you know, by like, by 1936, they were kind of all gone. You know, especially the guys in Texas, they would play the oil fields and say it's all gone. And these same guys would be like, well, what do you think about Ray Charles, you know, getting interviewed in like the 60s? And it's like, I've heard all, all that stuff's been done before. So these guys are feeling like all this music that, that would become popular music over the next 30 years was all happening in those, in those kind of places. Uh, one of the cool connections is, is, um, is, is what happened later. So, so there's a piano player, like we said, we're, we're in Chicago for a minute, and I left Chicago really quick, but all that boogie-woogie emerges and sort of has a, you know, some really cool things happen out of that. One of the great piano players out of, out of Chicago was a guy named Jimmy Yancey. And Jimmy Yancey was a uh, groundskeeper for the White Sox his whole life, um, was born in the, the 1890s, and he kind of had a style all his own. There's mixes of some of the... Um, um, sort of the tango, habanera rhythms, and things of that nature, but he had this real plaintive way of playing, and he had this great sort of boogie-woogie touch. And so I'm just going to play one of his tunes, because it was just a, sort of, uh, just a little different kind of feel of, of this music. And this guy is so interesting to me, because I can't quite... Well, there are guys you can kind of figure out where they came out of. Okay, they came out of a ragtime tradition. Okay, they heard this guy, they heard that guy. But, but this guy's a little different, so I'm going to play uh, one of his tunes called Jimmy's Stuff. He would have ended that song if you were right here. He would have been like. He would have ended in a totally different key. He had the same key. He had, had the same ending in E flat, regardless of what he played. But, but that's uh, some some Jimmy Yancey. So 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 by the by the late 30s, what happens is it's pretty much this barrel house blues tradition is pretty much gone, and how it gets carried forward is through Boogie Woogie. And so in that, in that Carnegie Hall concert, one of the pieces that 
A fellow Mead Lux Lewis plays is a tune called the Yancey Special, ba based off of Jimmy Yancey. And that was like his tribute because they all really loved and admired Jimmy Yancey in Chicago. They all wanted to hear him play at the rent parties and they would give him, give him his great respect. And that tune had this kind of left hand. Sort of a Jimmy, based on that sort of like Jimmy Yancey idea, but but with Mead Lux Lewis gave us his own touch. And what's cool about that is, if you listen to the very first recordings of Professor Longhair, the great New Orleans rhythm and blues pianist, this is in the 40s now, the, the, the later 40s, that's what he's playing. He plays the Jimmy, the Yancey special. And then, if, and then he'll take those rhythms and uh, add those sort of uh, Caribbean rumba rhythms and create that, what we think of as that iconic New, New Orleans sound. So I'm going to play a little of that New Orleans sound because you can just sort of hear that connection. Uh, here's here's Tipitina. <laughs> sort of ends up in those in those sort of great places. Um, I'm going to play one more tune for you guys, and then uh, and I really thank you all so much for hanging out with me. And yeah. some stuff. We have one question before I do that. Thank you guys. Is that uh, Yancey piece transcribed somewhere? So, someone, some of the Yancey stuff is transcribed. It's like tricky because there's a, there's a lot of subtlety in his left hand. So like for, for, for this Barrel House music, some of it is, is transcribed. But it's it's a tricky thing because they they are live performances, and so you have to make those decisions of like what do you sacrifice in trying to write out that so that it's legible still, and you're not accounting for well maybe that slide was on purpose, maybe that was a mistake, or how do you capture the nuances of that rhythm? So unlike so I I mean so I personally try not to learn this music through through transcriptions because you'll you'll see something, but it won't allow you really to get in there. So what you gain from seeing the note, you might lose some subtlety of feel and like really getting inside the piece. So I try to capture the feels of the pieces versus those notes. So like it's a tricky thing. Unlike ragtime, it's the opposite. So I, that's why I love learning ragtime uh, these days. It's been, it's, it's been a journey for me to find ragtime and now I've, I've really got the bug, something serious. But like that, that, that was meant to be disseminated through sheet music and, it, and so it should, how, it should how, be how it learned. But some of that, a lot of that Yancey stuff has been transcribed. Yeah. And it's like, and that's how I got in. So Jimmy Yancey was my first great love of this music. So I, I lived down in New Orleans, and I was, and I was, uh, this was about 2007, and I saw that, that left hand, that kind of uh, stuff going on, but, um, and so when I was trying it, I didn't have those rumba feels, those three, one, two, three, those rhythm feels, I didn't have any of that, I mean, you don't start with there, you don't start with that. So when I, what I was doing is, I was swinging it. And then, so when I found Jimmy Yancey about a year later, I said, well, that's what I've been trying to play this whole time. So Jimmy Yancey was sort of like, to me, he was like, he's just this great poet. There's a way into his music because it's not just pure virtuosity. There's like melody and there's a lot of meat to sort of attach onto. So that's really what, what got me going through this music. And then it kind of kept going back in time to find out more of those different styles and get into that sort of, like I hit a wall with the barrel house I'm playing because I couldn't play ragtime. So, 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 so a lot of that Texas stuff and a lot of that Little Brother Montgomery, I just, I couldn't do it. I, I didn't play, all these guys have great rags in their materials, just these, these, these raucous barrel housey rags that I sort of have left out, like I haven't 
really kept that strain going in this, in this because you can't do everything right now. So I talked a little bit more about Boogie Woogie and where that went versus sort of all the ways that ragtime was connected to this music still. So I think I'm going to end with a tune that sort of has that sort of ragged touch into it a little bit. And this is a tune, uh, this is a tune by Black Bob. Black Bob was a piano player in Chicago in the mid-30s. He was a session guy. That's, it, that's the only name we have for him. We don't know his full name. We just know him as Black Bob. He was on about 300 records in the mid-30s. All the Memphis Mini stuff, the Washboard Sam stuff, the Big Bill Brunzi, State Street Swingers. He was the session guy for all these Bluebird, and he really defined the sound, this good time jazz sound. You're coming out of the Depression. He's one of my very favorite piano players. He's so ragged. You know, we don't, like I said, we don't know anything about him, and, and, and he's, he's pretty much forgotten. And it's a shame because because nobody swung as hard as Black Bob. So I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a tune called um, Joe Lewis Strutt is the name of this tune. This was kind of the only sort of instrumental tune he did, although it's credited as a Memphis Mini track because Memphis Mini is sort of shouting on it and rooting him on. And, uh, and this will be the last tune. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. coming out and spending your afternoon with me, getting a little lesson in uh, this great music, mm -hmm. which I want to see more people playing, very much so. And uh, I, want, I want to see more ragtimers busting this stuff out, more boogie-woogie players, because it kind of falls in between. You kind of have to play both and enjoy both, and I think you should, because they're both great. <laughs> want one more tune? Is that, is yeah. that great? Yeah. All right. Well, let's see. Let's see here. 
<laughs> I'm going to do, do a piece that will maybe end up that fast. This is a tune called The 31 Blues. It's another great train imitation. It comes from a fellow named Bob Call, who was, uh, he might have picked up something from Will Ezel, who we talked about a long time ago. I'm sure it's a forgotten name to you guys already, but that's okay. Uh, so here's The 31 Blues, a sweet train imitation from 1929. <laughs> Wednesday night, so if you're not doing anything, come back and join me again. Be a great show. Also, always great players there. And I have some CDs in the back. Uh, the Lowdown Piano is my solo CD. I've also made a brand new record with uh, my piano guitar band called The Bottle Snakes. And that's all just instrumental, originals, sort of all in this sort of great 20s, 30s style. So uh, come see me on the uh, at the end. Now that's over, come see me. <laughs> Thank you so much.